Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. We're just giving it a minute or two for our broadcast community to get settled into this virtual learning space. We also know that there could be some individuals that are joining us via LinkedIn Live, and so we want to acknowledge and welcome those individuals as well. I will invite all of you to go to the chat or to the comment section if you're joining via LinkedIn. Let us know where you're joining the conversation from. We always really appreciate knowing where people are joining this conversation from. And typically we have representation across all over the country and even some folks outside of the US, which is always very exciting for us. We have been expecting you as we do each week, as we bring this opportunity for us to learn with and from each other. This is Intentional Conversations podcast. We intersect conversations of diversity, equity, and inclusion with leadership and business. So today will be no different. And we do have a wonderful guest co-host that has joined us today. And I cannot wait for you to meet her and to hear about her experience. I do want to let you know that cameras are encouraged, but they're certainly not required. We love to see smiling faces, but if you're joining us just in an auditory capacity, then that is absolutely fine. We're glad you're here nonetheless. We do have closed caption available. It's our way of really leaning in and supporting disability inclusion. And so if that is of use to you, certainly make sure that you take advantage of it. The chat is also our way to create a sense of community with each other. And so if something is said today, we want you to go to the chat, share your sentiments, your thoughts. If a resource comes to mind that you believe will be of value to this larger community, then share it into the chat. But we are so glad you're here. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Intentional Conversations podcast. Welcome. Again, for those of you who are just joining us, I am Dr. Nika White. My pronouns are she, her, and I have the honor of serving as founder and lead principal consultant for NWC. And we bring this broadcast opportunity to the broader community every single week at this time, Friday from 11 a.m. to 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. And it's our way of allowing those who would like to deepen their knowledge and their understanding of all matters concerning diversity, equity, and inclusion of belonging, that they have a way to do so. I am being supported today by my amazing team at NWC, and so I always like to shout them out for the wonderful work that they do to make sure that this, the virtual production of our vodcast is something that is adding value to each of us who find time to join week after week. You also are aware, if you've been joining us, that not only is this a podcast opportunity, but we do take the audio and we make it available in a podcast capacity. So for those who like to get your content in that regard, there's multiple ways for you to be a part of this community. So spread the word, let others know. They can catch the replay or even wherever they like to get their podcasts, they can catch the content from the podcast. So we are in the month of Native American heritage, and I want to just recognize that it's so important for us to take an opportunity to help um, bring about awareness and exposure to different cultures and backgrounds, especially as it relates to some of those national observances. But we always say, don't just do it during that month. Let's just let that encourage us to dig deeper, to understand more, to build relationships, to ally, to advocate, whatever we can to help bring about greater parity and opportunity for those that may be different from us or a part of those underrepresented communities. Now, I often like to share with our podcast community what you have to look forward to in the upcoming weeks. And so November the 11th, we are welcoming Dr. Tawana Burroughs, and we are going to be talking about how successful leaders are great coaches. She owns and operates a great DEI coaching organization, and I cannot wait for you to hear more about that. We also have Mia Sumpat. Putt that's going to be joining us as well, my friend, on November the 18th, and we're going to discuss healing from harm that is a result of bias, and specifically in the form of internalized bias, imposter syndrome, and using confidence for effective allyship and advocacy. So another great conversation that I know is going to be really rich, and so make sure you mark your calendars and you join us on November 18th. 
Now, while we're talking about November and upcoming dates, I also want to let you know we will not be here for vodcast on November 25th. The team will be celebrating and hopefully each of you will be doing the same with your friends and families over Thanksgiving holiday. And so make sure that you are using that time to connect with friends and family. And we look forward to seeing you um, after that time. Now, it is always my pleasure and honor to provide a formal introduction of our guest co-hosts each week. I like to read their accolades, their credentials, let you know a little bit about the lens in which they're showing up to the conversation. And then the next voice that you will hear will be none other than Martine actually joining the conversation to greet you in her own way. But let me give you her official bio. Having experienced life as a Black immigrant woman and a stateless, undocumented person, Martine Kalau understands firsthand the implications of being excluded and marginalized in society. But attending a private school and getting access to golden opportunities in life, despite her disadvantages, exposed her to both ends of the spectrum helping her develop empathy towards each person's perspective. Martine is now on a mission to bridge the gap between these different worlds. She believes in the topic of DEI and that it shouldn't be limited to marginalized people only. It's time to invite everyone into this space and make it safe and life-changing experience for all. Martine has a master's in public administration with a focus on immigration policy from the Maxwell School at Syracuse University. So vodcast community, or if you're joining me live, you can go to the chat, but in every way that feels appropriate, I want you to share some emojis, some words of encouragement or gratitude, but just let us allow Martine to feel welcome. She takes the center stage and shares with us and greets us in her own way. So Martine, welcome. We're so glad you're here. We are super excited to be able to hear from you, hear more about your story, more about all of the great information that we know that you're going to share. I'm adding you to the spotlight now. And one of the things that we often like to do here on Intentional Conversations podcast, once we read a person's bio and of course express all of the great credentials that they bring to the conversation, is give that person an opportunity to answer what is it that we don't know about you that we would not be able to read in your bio that will help us have a deeper understanding and appreciation of the lens in which you're going to show up to this conversation. So with that, I will turn it over to you to greet this audience and address that first initial question before we dive right in. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. White. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you on this Friday af morning, afternoon-ish uh, to answer your first question, what is it that people may not know about me that um, frames why I'm so passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion? And the answer is that, you know, the woman you see in front of you today might appear to be more confident than I once was. There was a time where I experienced a loss of dignity because of the space that I existed in, um, because of the body that I lived in, because of my circumstances. And so when I talk about wanting to bridge the gap, it really is about wanting to restore dignity to individuals that lack it, that feel that they don't have it because they're in dislocated space spaces or underrepresented in certain communities and environments. And the other part of restoring dignity is allowing others who are on the other side of it, who have access to not see those people, us, individuals who are in underrepresented groups as charity, not to see DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion as charity work, but as an investment, as a business investment, as a personal investment, as an economic investment, right? As a, as a social investment. So there you have it. That is awesome. What a great way to start and um, to kick off the conversation. Um, I have no doubt that this is going to be a really rich hour of great dialogue. So I, I know that you have two books and we're going to talk about both today, but I want to first talk about a memoir that you wrote a while back, mm -hmm. um, Women Without an Identity. And um, this memoir, just to set this up, and I want you to take us on this journey, if you will, to help us to understand um, your story and why, you know, producing this memoir was so important. But for 13 years, you were an undocumented immigrant and seven years in deportation. Mm 
And so please share with this audience as much of that journey that you feel is relevant that will help us to have a deepened understanding of, of your experience on the lens that you have. Absolutely. And if I may, I'm just going to hold this up because the title changed a while back. It was the book was uh, published in 2018. So, okay. uh, Illegal Among Us, A Stateless Woman's Quest for Citizenship. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. You're so welcome. It was so important for me to write this memoir um, to authenticate myself. So it's one thing to come to this conversation of DEI from just the perspective of I study this, I you know I I have ex- expertise, but I've lived the experience um, of being in many dislocated spaces and having to um, navigate and learning how to uh, acclimate myself or assimilate into certain spaces and pivot my lens to understand where other people were coming from as a survival mechanism. So let me backtrack a little bit and just share with the audience. I was born in Zambia. My family's from DR Congo in Africa. Um, I came to the US when I was four years old. Um, Long story short, I lost my parents, my mother and stepfather, and became orphaned. And shortly thereafter, I became not only undocumented, but stateless. So stateless, Mm -hmm. uh, for all intents and purposes, is a person who does not have a country, right? Mm -hmm. And that's also important because um, many people don't understand the ecosystem of immigration. And even within that space, there's a lot of lack, there's a lot of bias, right? So for example, when we looked at, and we saw a few months ago, we saw images, heartbreaking images of Haitian migrants, you know, attempting to enter the US. And then we saw these harrowing images of, you know, border patrol um, with whips and so forth. What yeah. people did not realize and don't realize is that many of those individuals were stateless. Right. So they don't have country. So when people are saying, well, why are they coming here? You know, can they go back or like they should go back to Haiti? They can't go back to Haiti. They're stateless. Right. And they're stateless because of discrimination, because of racism, which is one type of um, discrimination that exists within the, the framework of diversity, equity and inclusion. So to make the long story short, um, these many of these Haitian, uh, quote unquote, migrants are originally were born in the Democrat uh, in, in uh, Dominican Republic, right? Mm-hmm. And their parents were born in Dominican Republic, and their grandparents were born in the Dominican mm-hmm. Republic. However, Dominican Republic established this really draconian, uh, you know, rule a couple of years ago that said if you are um, of African or Black descent in Dominican Republic, um, you know, your 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 citizenship is revoked predating back to 1940 something, right? So what that means is if you are Haitian ethnically and were was born in Dominican Republic and your parents were also Haitian ethnically and born in Dominican Republic, you and your parents no longer are citizens of Dominican Republic. Well, you're also not citizens of Haiti because you weren't born in Haiti. So mm-hmm. That is how some of many of these individuals ended up crossing the border to save their lives because they have nowhere to go, right? And that's the story that no one, the media isn't really portraying and sharing. And that's important. So that's that's an aspect of diversity, equity, and inclusion within the framework of immigration. So like I said, to make the long story short, Dr. White, you might have to cut in and jump in and stop me if you're fine. Quite (laughs) verbose. this is why I was so impassioned by DEI, not only because of those types of experiences and lack of representation in a space of immigration, but because I also consider my privilege in the yeah. space being stateless and documented. Uh, I knew yeah. that because of the way I look and sound, um, compared to my friend who was also stateless, Muslim, Black man, that people might have a little bit more sympathy for me as opposed to him. And we would have these conversations. I also knew in my studies, this was in my college, my senior year college thesis um, at my undergrad, Hamilton College in upstate New York, was doing comparative analysis on Black um, Sudanese refugees um, compared to white 
of Bosnian refugees and if there was preferential treatment in assimilating into the local community. Mm -hmm. I was going into their houses. I was, you know, into the houses of these refugees. I was trying to understand was there preferential treatment based on their skin color, based on their race? Mm -hmm. their and the answer was yes. Right. Mm. And so I was immediately from, the, you know, before I even knew, before the DEI even existed, that terminology, I was already um, connected to it and interested in it from a personal level, but also from um, from an academic, right, scholarly um, level and interest. So that is why and how I'm in the space that I'm in. So this is a little bit more about, you know, that background. You are educating us and I am I'm so grateful. So, you know, we like to bring um, different types of conversations to the Intentional Conversations podcast. And um, I don't believe in the almost two years or two plus years that we've been doing this, have we had very specific conversations about immigration. So a part of what you are bringing to, to this, this community is some education, especially around the relevance of what does it mean to be stateless and the implications of that. I don't think that, you know, to your point, is something that we all often think about. So I, I'm grateful for that. Okay, so I want to move to your next book, because I think that this is also going to allow us to talk more about how in which you take all of your experience and your, uh, your, 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 intellect to to help further the work of DEI and with the organizations that you work with. And so your book is entitled ABCs of Diversity, a manager's guide to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the new workplace, right? Yes. And I, I see that we also have placed into the chat um, the title of your the book that I had just referenced, Illegal Among Us, A Stateless Woman's Quest for Citizenship. So definitely want to draw attention to that, to all of those who are um, who are part of this, this conversation today. But can you talk about the, the, the crux of your book in terms of the main premise? Who was the book for? What have you, um, what, what can you share in terms of what people can expect? Um, what can they learn? Just talk a little bit about the book. Absolutely, Dr. White. So it occurred to me that, you know, as I was working in certain spaces, uh, companies, organizations, and I would come in and try to drive DEI and ask, you know, executives, um, you know, what is your corporate statement on DEI? What do you think? The response yes. almost all the time that I would get across different organizations, particularly from the CEOs, from the highest level executives within the organization who happen to be white men, and statistically we know that's true, mm -hmm. they would say, I, I don't really want to, I, I don't feel like this is my place to say anything, right? I, I don't, I feel like I'm not allowed to say anything. I don't want to say the wrong thing. So it occurred to me that that's the problem, right? Because if these are the individuals that are driving corporate America, they're driving our economy, and they're not involved and engaged in the conversation, then we have a bigger problem here. Right. Nothing will really get solved. So what I wanted to do was create, write a book that simplified diversity, and for some, that's really offensive, right? Because diversity is mm -hmm. not simple. But yeah. what we do, what I think, um, what I've observed is that we take, many of us um, rely on the academic, you know, uh, definitions of diversity and we get tripped up. We get tripped yeah. up on language, on um, phrases, and we don't really mean what we say, and we're afraid to say anything. We're afraid to ask questions. And that's the problem. That actually prevents us from learning, from engaging in discourse, from understanding somebody else's perspective. So I wanted the ABCs of diversity to really be a reminder that, hey, a lot of these techniques around diversity are the very things we do every day, right? Yeah managers, leaders and organizations, you coach people, you coach mm -hmm. your team. Well, when there's an issue where someone comes to you and says they feel offended because they experience a microaggression, usually they may not use that terminology. You don't get to freak out. You get to do rely on what you already know to do, right? You yeah. ask clarifying questions, you learn, you understand, you try to understand the person. Your role is not to determine whether they're right or wrong. It's really to understand them, to validate their feelings and to work with them in coming up with a solution. 
being their mm. active ally, right? These are things we already know to do, but we're get, we get so tripped up on, am I saying this correctly? Am I saying that correctly? And we think that's what DEI is. And therefore many of us stay out of it. Like we don't wanna be involved in the conversation. So that is the reason I wrote this book. Secondly, I wanted to focus primarily on human resources professionals and managers. Why? Because when we think about the workplace and who really influences the trajectory of an individual in the workplace through hiring, compensation, promotion, you know, attrition, it really comes down to the relationship and the conversations that are happening between the manager or the leader of a team of a person and human resources. So yeah. why not equip them with this information? So manager training, manager development that happens, that should be happening in organizations should be embedded with these concepts, right? DEI doesn't have to be this separate idea. It's, it's part of just being a, a good leader, an effective leader. So that's why it was important for me to write this book and it's meant to be a primer, right? I'm a trainer. I'm a trainer by, by, by heart. So I wanted this book to feel like a workshop, right? Where mm -hmm. you read a chapter. It's not a big book, right? It's not intimidating. You read a small chapter. There is a self-reflection -re piece at, at the end of every chapter where you can process what you just read. And then there's an application. Now take it back to your team and try this, right? If you don't have a formal mentorship program, think about, this is an example, think about when we think about, um, you know, equity, when there aren't formal mentorship programs in organizations, what sometimes can happen is that people build those mentorship relationships in these, you know, in these small enclaves, events, mm -hmm. happy hours on the golf course. But, and however, there are some people that don't feel invited into those spaces. So how do they navigate and identify and find a mentor, manager, leader, consider that. So what can you do? How about this? And I give some offerings of ideas and of the steps that they can take. So that's really what the book is and the premise of the book is, is, a, is about. I love that great overview and, and so much synergy to the way in which you like to approach helping to bring people along in their journey around this work. I do believe that um, it can feel, you know, it meaning the work of diversity, equity and inclusion can feel very daunting. It yeah. can feel sometimes unattainable. And sometimes just that threat alone will cause people to sit on the sidelines and do nothing. And we know that inaction is is not the, um, the, the most effective approach for us to really be able to create the society that we want. Um, um, so in making it practical with examples and allowing people to critically reflect on how am I feeling about what I'm hearing and, and how can I apply it, um, I think is really smart. Um, it's meant now, to be and I, you know? Yeah, just, it's a primer. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. And I also love the fact that there is a focus from an audience perspective on middle managers. You know, one of the things that I have expressed a lot lately has been that so often we will have these, these big discussions about how do we bring the C-suite level along? You know, how do we make sure that they're in sync and aligned around the value of this work and how in which they want to see it manifested throughout the organization? And I believe that those conversations are critical. But what I also tell people is let's not forget about the middle managers, because while that group is very influential, the ones who are touching from a day to day perspective, more of the critical mass of people are those middle managers. And so I love the fact that that's also a conclusion that it sounds like you focused um, this yeah. book on. And so Absolutely. I yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about how many are threatened by DEI work, right? You work with a number of organizations and, um, you know, I think that it's appropriate for us to identify more innovative strategies to make sure that we are starting the dialogue with employees and not being afraid to name 
where we are sensing that people um, are threatened by it, either because they're uncomfortable, either because they have a lack of clarity, either because they're against it, you know, for whatever, you know, reasons. Um, but how, how can we really broach those conversations in a way that is honest and productive and begins to shift, not necessarily just hearts and minds, because I think that sometimes that can be hard, but if nothing else, at bare minimum, behaviors, because sometimes that's a win as well, right? Yeah. So what are some suggestions that you often share with a lot of the clients that you work with? That's a great question, um, Dr. White. I, you know, what I always, I, I learned this through my journey of being stateless and documented. I learned the hard way that you can't tell people that you're hurting. They just won't get it, right? You can tell people you're hurting until you're blue in the face. It won't resonate with them. You have to speak their language. And oftentimes in workspaces, um, in the context of DE&I, we start with stories and those stories are absolutely important, but we're usually the choir, right? Sharing our stories and wanting the individuals at the highest level of our organization to get it. We're not speaking their language. They won't, it won't resonate with them. So where we, we have to meet them halfway and find that common, that common denominator. And I always bring it back to the business right? Um, the, the bottom line, right? And for some people, right? This, they might, I mean, this, some of your audience members might be startled by this, like, oh my gosh, she's talking about DEI and monies. Yes, I am, right? It doesn't cheapen it because DEI is the right thing to do, but it's also the smart thing to do. So we need mm -hmm. to allow and remind our leaders that DEI can have an impact on your key performance indicators. Mm -hmm. If you're a business to consumer company, are you considering, you're missing market share. I mean, there's a right. whole lot of people um, and communities that we're not accessing. If you're business to business, well, who are your partners? How are you retaining them? Do you speak their language? Are you able to connect with them? Do you know who their customers are? And are you able to appeal to them so that they can support and appeal to their customers, right? This drives our bottom line. And so that's one reason people are afraid to enter yeah. the conversation of DEI, especially the people at the highest, at the helm of an organization. It's because they don't, they don't know where they fit in, right? And they don't want to be shamed or blamed with just the stories. So when you start with that common denominator, then people are bought in, okay, I'm starting to see the importance or the value of this, at least from a business standpoint. Now I can start listening to the story. So that's one way. The other is I think, you know, we create this good, bad dichotomy we generally in the space of DEI, right? Mm -hmm. If you say something that offends me, you're automatically a bad person. I'm going to attack you. I'm going to say something yeah. like, no, that you offended me. And then now I feel like, now you might feel like I'm attacking your character and you yeah. might feel like, okay, I'm never going to talk about this again. I'm never going to ask a question. I just don't even want to be a part of this. So what I like to do is create those safe spaces where I ask my the audience the people that i'm speaking with in organizations to give each other grace right to assume that for the most part there are some bad people in the world right i mean let's not kid ourselves but for the most part most people aren't bad right their intentions are good their words might be off they might be wrong so when we hear something that we don't like we get the choice to ask ourselves do I think this person is intentionally trying to hurt me or yeah. do they not understand? Is this an opportunity to teach a, a, a learning opportunity? Yeah. So that's the approach we get to take with this conversation as well. Now, so much to unpack there. And um, for, for the sake of those who could be listening in either today live through LinkedIn or through actually those who are joined here as part of our podcast community, or maybe someone who's, you know, watching the replay later in the future. For those who have these strong convictions around, shouldn't the common ground though be humanity? You're mm -hmm. human, I'm human. We all deserve this you know, level of dignity, respect, full opportunity for success. Why is that not enough? And I just want you to respond to that question. <laughs> That's a great question. And I would follow up by saying, 
You know, we hear about and we know all of the atrocities that are going on in the world, in our neighborhoods, right next door. Why aren't we all stepping out of our comfort zones to yeah. affect change in all these spaces, right? right? Because, yeah. and when we do, when we choose to uh, donate our monies or to do work and get involved in whether it's, you know, immigration, a heart walk, cancer society, whatever mm-hmm. it is, it's because it kind of connected to it, right? In some ways, yeah. someone in our family had cancer, someone in our family had cystic fibrosis. You know, I, you know, if I'm, if I'm involved in working with, um, you know, with orphans, it's because maybe I grew up as an orphan, right? So That's that right. was the reason, right? So like I said, I know firsthand that just letting people, reminding people that I'm hurting and that they should have compassion for me just from that human standpoint is not always enough because there's so many issues and challenges and problems in the world. So people have a short attention span and don't know where to uh, direct their attention. So that's that's the immediate um, response I have. And Dr. Wright, one last thing about your previous question around the concerns and fears people have around DEI. What I often see, I was working, one of my past clients was a private equity client. And one of the first things I do when I work with organizations, and because they asked me to do an assessment, right? Um, An audit, if you will. And one of the first things I say is, what are, you know, what are, what are, what is our baseline? What are your metrics, right? What are, what are our targets? What are we trying to get to, right? So we've got to look at the numbers and that's where the fear also comes in, right? Because there are yes. DEI analytics tools. There's one that I'm, I'm a marketplace partner of. I think it's, it's probably the only DEI analytics tool out there. It's called Dandy, everyone. Um, but I kid you not, um, that always creates a sense of reservation for people because now, you know, they don't want the mirror to be placed in front of them of where they have to see all the numbers. But what I try to remind people, is we all, we're all starting from somewhere, right? Yeah. And if we don't look at the numbers, then how, you know, we don't have a baseline and how can we actually know if we're making a change, if we're growing, right? Um, and the goal is not, you know, to increase that would be ideal to increase representation by, you know, X percentage basis points in, you know, in a month, right? We've got to be realistic with our goals, but what we get to do is hold ourselves and each other accountable in the the organization by looking at those metrics, being able to actually see the stories, being able to actually identify where the opportunities are um, and not make it about just ourselves, but about improving and enhancing the organization. No, so good. And I'm noticing that my colleague placed into the chat the um, the the reference that you made to Dandy with the um, the, the DEI assessment. Um, so, uh, so much is coming up for me. The first thing is, yes, you're absolutely right. There's so many people who are afraid of the data, right? And so even sometimes getting them to the point where they are willing to say yes, to invest the time and money and, and collecting the data can be uh, the uphill battle, right? right. Um, we often say, see all data as opportunity, not right, wrong, good or bad, but just a way to assess where you are. But it does create a sense of accountability as it should, because once now you've been exposed to that information, what are you going to do with it, right? Right. What are you going, and it's not to say that there's an expectation where you have to solve all the things overnight, right? I mean, I think that sometimes the perception is that we're going to uncover all of these things, we're going to be expected to fix it and fix it overnight. It's about progress and not perfection, right? right? It is about being committed to the journey of getting the data and letting that data inform where the priority should be, right? Um, and, and and so I appreciate the fact that you brought that to the conversation. I wanna go back to the previous question though, because, and I am totally with you, by the way, let me, let me just preface that by saying I am with you. I feel like we have swung the pendulum too far in one direction. And what I'm referring to is the whole business case conversation, right? 
And I too was one of those DEI practitioners that I was always clear about leading with the business case, the business case. And I think that depending upon the audience, that's mm -hmm. appropriate. It is about being strategic, not only bringing your passion, but also bringing your, your skill, right? As will and skill, bringing your intellect, bringing your ability to know how to persuade and to connect with people for the end goal. Mm -hmm. And depending upon who's on the receiving end of that conversation, that's what's going to motivate them that's is being right. able to understand the connection point. That's right. Where yep. I have found though that I have evolved a little bit is that where I can, I try not to lead with that if it's a broad audience and it's not just that direct kind of C-suite CFO type leader that's looking for the connection to the bottom line. And the reason why is because I do think that it can undermine the importance of the emphasis just on the humanity capacity, right? Mm -hmm. The humanity question. Yeah. And so a reframe for me has been talking about it as the DEI value proposition. And the value is the value to the individuals. So it could be the individuals that are most marked marginalized, right? But also the value to the organization. So there's multiple ways to look at it. And I have found that that reframe has been a good way to kind of hold the middle, right? Okay. <laughs> um, because I am not in favor of abandoning the idea of all of the strong research we have that tells us time and time again, that it makes good business sense, right? That's and right. so anyway, um, but I, I felt I felt the need to circle back just to say, yes, I'm I agree. you emphasize that because that is important and uh, you do have to know your audience. So yeah. oftentimes my my initial audience is that C-suite, right? What yeah. I yeah. know yeah. your audience. But when I have an invitation to speak to the broader audience, staff, employees, that's not the direction we want to go, right? You can alienate people by starting from that conversation. So we want to be mindful of that. Um, I was on a panel um, yesterday, and one of the things that I mentioned as I was talking about um, that business case part was just to remind them, because they were uh, the group that invited me in was a DEI employee resource group, otherwise known as an ERG. Mm -hmm. um, they invited me in and they said, hey, what are the things we can look out for and think about and consider um, as as we're, you know, moving and promoting, um, you know, DEI. And I said, well, you know, think about your audience. So while this is, you know, this is a humanity, uh, a conversation around humanity for this ERG, you know, as you're trying to influence or hold leadership to something, also remember that approach of what they need to hear and they what they yeah. would you know, value hearing. And lastly, you know, tying in that business piece to um to to the analytics tool the yes. reason i do think the business conversation is important to emphasize for certain audiences is because it's easy for organizations to cut corners right so yes. i've seen oftentimes um organizations will say oh yeah you know we've got we've got an analytics tool we have an hris mm -hmm. we've got you know we've got this we've got you know um tableau great those are not designed for DEI right. analytics, right? So mm -hmm. if you brought me in, or if you if you started, you know, if you have a, a department, let's say uh, security systems, a security uh, department, you wouldn't cut corners and use a different, you know, a, a system that's for human resources to measure security, you know, training right. and security, you know, uh, within an organization. So why would we cut corners around DEI? So that is part of the reason that I think that business piece reinforces yeah. that human conversation and the, that emotional intelligence conversation around um, DEI in the workplace. No, really valid point. And Martine, it also reminds me of how, I don't know if you experienced this, but at NWC, we often, when we do this deep dive, you know, audits or, or cultural assessments yeah. um, that's very specifically focused on DEI, sometimes, you know, client partners will say, well, we already have this best place to work survey or right. this, you know, climate culture, you know, assessment. And I'm sure that there are pockets of maybe questions, right, right. that are intended to get at, you know, some of the very specific DEI related questions that find its way into that targeted, you know, study or audit. But to your point, I feel like it's not a either or. It needs to be a both and, right? And sometimes right. what we like right. to see is, is that there, there aren't too many surprises. What you've heard from your cultural assessments or from the best places to work questions that are incorporated into that type of assessment, that there's some level of um, alignment around the data that's being collected. Um, so I don't think it's an either or. I think it's kind of a both and okay. situation. I love that. I agree with that. 
Yeah. So we have a question that's in the chat. And by the way, I just want to let you know that we do love getting questions for each of you. And so I'm going to present a question that has been um, placed into the chat. But I want to remind you that if you have a question or you would like to share it live, then raise your hand. I will call on you. I will add you to the spotlight, give you an opportunity to unmute yourself, to present your question or, or share your commentary. Um, but if not, and you want your question to be presented for you, then place it into the chat. And so this question comes from Karen Paris. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And she says this, one of the fears I'm hearing from management at my company when it comes to DEI is the fear of being accused of not being inclusive when they need to legitimately fire someone. They are afraid of what to do when someone uses the race card, when they are trying to fire someone which makes them hesitant to hire diverse employees if they feel as though they won't be able to fire them. What is your advice to change this mindset? Good question, Karen, thank you. What would you say to that, Martine? Yeah, so if I'm understanding correctly, um, the question, I'm, you know, and please, Dr. White, um, help me to synthesize this if I'm, if sure. I'm not understanding it correctly. Um, the concern is that, you know, someone, if, if an organization, um, particularly, uh, I guess it most likely would be the equivalent of human resources, is wanting to let someone go, um, they are likely to circle back to the manager and start to just, you know, it, it, you know, explore the, the question of, of bias? Is that, is that the question? Is that the question? Yeah, I think so. The way that I'm interpreting Karen's question is that, you know, we often have heard the expression of people using the race card, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that the notion here, the sentiment is that there are some managers and some leaders who really want to be able to hold people accountable, provide the tough feedback, you know, the constructive, you know, um, criticism where it may be needed um, to help, you know, catapult someone into the, to the right direction. But sometimes they shy away from that because they are afraid that someone may accuse them of some type of discriminatory or bias um, um, perception, and specifically what she is saying using the race card. I hope I'm capturing that correctly. People don't want to hire people yeah. if they can't fire them, right? Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, um, that's a really great question. And what I would say is that, you know, it starts with conversation and dialogue. Uh, first of all, I think this is this is these are the types of conversations that we need to have, right? The fears that we have as leaders and managers within organizations around DEI, um, around you know, I've heard concerns about you know the concern about DEI being um, you know a, a, an emphasis on DEI might actually be might lead to certain individuals being replaced by people of color or people from underrepresented groups. So these are good questions that we get to ask ourselves and to discuss. So the first thing that I would say is, um, you know, with these fears, um, you know, one of the things we want to consider is, or one of the questions we get to ask ourselves is, you know, what is, you know, if you have an individual, right, that you're struggling with in the workplace who works on your team and um, they're challenged in their work, they're not working effectively, um, what conversations have you had with them, right? Um, what, what access um, or opportunities have they had? What conversations and what coaching has happened, right? Because it doesn't have to be about race, right? It doesn't have to yeah. be about the race card. It starts with you walking them and talking them through and having conversations about where they are, where they see their opportunity to develop, where you see their opportunity to develop and the why, right? The why is such an important piece of this, right? Because that's, I think, the fear that some of us have as leaders. Um, that's the, the fear that some of us have as leaders is that, you know, we're going to uh, have a conversation with someone, they're going to accuse us of being biased, and then we're in trouble. However, if we start the conversation with general coaching, explaining where we see the person going, where we'd like to see them going, right? And then asking them where they see themselves, where they see themselves having opportunity. Where do you see yourself having challenges, right? Okay, well, let me tell you where I see that you have challenges. Um, that's the first 
point of conversation, right? Because that's real. That's you being a leader and saying, I actually, these, these are my expectations for the team, right? These are my expectations for you, right? This is where I want to see you go. This is where I see you lacking, where do you see yourself lacking, right? And that's where the conversation sits. Now, now the curse concern might also be around you not wanting to say the wrong thing, right? You don't want to seem biased or you don't want the person, yeah. the perception of, uh, of bias or microaggression, but that becomes an opportunity for us, right? As leaders, as managers to, um, to to expose to 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 be more to have more exposure to diversity to uh you know to other other communities other cultures because the more we do that the more familiar and comfortable we are in different and in, in in you know diverse spaces so we know how to navigate these conversations we know um we might we're much more aware of something that might be perceived or misperceived as a microaggression right so yeah. for example if i happen to be a manager and let's say i'm not sitting in the body that i'm sitting i happen to be uh, a male and i'm talking to my you know my female uh team member and I give this person her feedback and say, you know, you're, you know, I'd like for you to be less aggressive, um, you know, when you're leading conversations, right? So we know that that is tied, right, to right. a microaggression, right? There are certain biases that are attached and stereotypes and tropes that are tied to gender and women in the workplace and being aggressive, right? So if I, you know, have a, a community where I have access and I'm ex I have exposure to other women in the workplace, right, and I've created and established diversity in the spaces that I live in, I know and I am aware of those potential microaggressions. So I'm less likely to say those things. So I can have a conversation with my female direct report and give this her feedback on her development. And I don't necessarily, and I, I understand that her aggression might actually be assertiveness, right? And yeah. that's a good thing. And that might not necessarily actually be the issue. It might actually be something else. It might be the, you know, the way that she communicates um, or the way that she delegates to someone else on her team, right? Um, that doesn't really allow that person to, to vocalize their ideas or thoughts in a team meeting, right? So that's much more specific than using jargon and terminology that could be a microaggression. So I hope that I explained that a little bit, you know, I, I, I went on, I kind of meandered a little bit, but ultimately my response is, one, you know, you shouldn't be afraid to lead your team or, or bring on someone um, because you're afraid, because we're afraid of potentially being targeted as someone who's biased or racist or any of those things, right? We get to invite diversity. So therefore, right, we can mitigate all those potential biases we might have, right? And the more that we're exposed to these spaces, diverse spaces, the more we understand what is, um, you know, what is unacceptable or uh, what is you know, not the, 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 the approach or the, the, the terminology or words to use and what is appropriate, what's not appropriate, right? Um, and we get to remember that we can still be managers and still lead and still coach and ask questions and uh, open it up for dialogue and get feedback. Yeah, to me, Martine, I think it boils down to the need for upskilling around what inclusive leadership looks like in practice and action, the day-to-day -day yeah. things that these managers, um, people leaders should be putting and incorporating into their management leadership style, right? Yeah. So I appreciate Karen's question because I have heard those sentiments from others as well about, you know, my, my, my leaders or my people leaders are afraid to provide the constructive feedback because they fear that somebody may say that they're just being biased or discriminating against them. So um, the fear of being accused of not being inclusive when someone feels 
that legitimately they need to excuse someone, transition someone from the organization is problematic. It's problematic because then it sends this message that DEI is all about coddling people, okay. not holding people accountable, um, giving people a pass when they aren't performing. And that's not what this is about. And that so I love the fact well. that the question yeah. allows us to, to amplify you know, some of the misinformation that's out there about DEI right. that we need people to unlearn. It is strictly right. about upskilling for what does inclusive leadership look like? It's not not holding people accountable. If someone is not meeting the mark um, and they need to, again, be placed on a performance improvement plan or they need to be transitioned out of the organization, then you follow whatever the protocol is, right? Whatever that practice and the protocol is, you follow it consistently across the board. Where organizations fall down is in their lack of ability to plan in advance to make sure they're setting themselves up for success, right? So in a question like that, I will say, if you need to legitimately fire someone, what have you done to help upskill them, to help provide the support that they may need to understand what the challenges are, right? It's mm -hmm. all of those things. And so I, I and yeah, anyway, I, I also add that it really is the, it's the, 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 they're larger questions to your point, Dr. White, the question is, you know, what, what was the hiring process, right? Yes. Um, you know, DEI is really about widening, widening um, the 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 net, the widening the network and finding qualified top people. It's not about giving people a pass who don't not deserve to be there. When we widen not the net, at look at spaces that we haven't considered, and we're still right looking at qualified candidates, we're likely to bring in diversity, right? But people who are qualified, right? So that Absolutely. becomes too. Well, what does the hiring process look like when you're approaching, you're thinking about um, increasing diversity in the organization? When our organizations are doing that, are we taking the approach of widening the net but looking for qualified people? Or are we saying, okay, well, we just need to find people from diverse backgrounds, quote unquote, because sometimes I do hear organizations say that. And when we do do that, we set ourselves up and that person up for failure because yes. they come in and they can't perform at the level that we need them to. So Absolutely. those are, things that are important. And to your point, the upskilling, the inclusion piece, how much, how, what is the perception of inclusion and belonging that the, that the person has, right? Because sometimes that does Oftentimes, and studies show that does affect performance as well. So, what are we doing to allow, especially when we're, you know, we're, we're, we we exist in a virtual work work environment more often than not? How do we make, uh, you know, how are we as leaders um, inviting and creating a sense of inclusion? What opportunities are available to these individuals, to, to individuals within our teams to grow, right? These, th this is part of upskilling, right? But, yeah. and however, um, you know, if the person is not up to par, then you shouldn't keep them there just yeah. because, and I absolutely agree with that. And so those right. are it's not fair to them as well. That's what we have to realize too. You know, it's not fair to them. We owe it to people to help them to be placed in an environment um, where they can really leverage all of their superpowers. They can thrive, they can grow. And so it does the organization nor the individual any good if there's not a commitment to providing that, that level of, of support. So going back to Karen's question, I want to just amplify something that Lisa placed, Lisa White um, placed into the chat. Um, I think that it is important to make sure they have been given every opportunity to be successful, talking about those candidates. If they have been if they have been supported through coaching and mentoring, which is kind of the point that I was making, yeah. if you can say that they have been given the tools, they will be more receptive to that feedback, right? Feedback. I think also has to be performance specific. So yes, I I, I completely agree, Lisa. Thank you for for chiming in with that. Absolutely. Something else that's a big yeah yeah something else, Martine. I want to get your thoughts on that's a big pet peeve for me. Why is it that routinely it feels like when organizational leaders are are trying to increase representation and diversity across you know different sectors and communities that are not in the applicant pool because we know that's part of. Yeah. Um, creating greater level of workforce diversity is to do that. But why is it that as we're talking about targeting diverse talent, there's always this compelling reason for some people to automatically place qualified in there. 
I want diverse qualified talent. And my thing is, is that since when are we hiring people that are not qualified? Right, right. Absolutely. Well, I'm so bothered by that. It, it bothered. First of all, I, I even the, the term diverse talent bothers me because like nobody's diverse. We're diverse. Exactly. 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 We're just yes. Individuals. Um, but I think what happens is um, what I've experienced in, in the work that I've done is um, there are there's a real and legitimate fear that people have. And this is all misinformation again, yeah, that yeah. You know, in the interest of creating diversity, some people are scared of losing their jobs, right? Yes. They're fearful that, okay, diversity means I might lose my job to somebody else, right? Who might not be as qualified just because they're from an underrepresented group. Like this is the misconception. These are the fears that people have and they're afraid to share, right? Um, And so that is the reason that we have, oftentimes you hear people's leadership, you know, recruitment, what have you say that this, these are diverse qualified talent is to, um, to to just mitigate these fears that people have. And that's unfortunate, yeah. right? And so I think that there's a deeper conversation that has to happen within organizations, right? And I, I think agree. that's where hiring managers, again, back to you know my you know my book and what I talk about, this is where managers get to help to demystify what diversity is, right? Mm-hmm. We don't have to remind people that it's about you know, qualified talent, of course they're qualified. How would they be able to do the job if they're not qualified, right? I had an example, I actually was speaking to someone who said, you know, Martine, this is really, the thing is, um, my issue with diversity is, you know, years ago, this person said they remembered that they had to you know, that, you know, the company was pushing diversity and they had two, they had two candidates. They wanted two individuals um, on their team that they wanted to promote. One happened to be, you know, an Iranian woman and another happened to be a white male. And Mm -hmm. they felt like they had to promote the Iranian woman because that's what they had to do because there was a push Mm -hmm. for diversity and quotas. Right. And really Mm -hmm. that's really what it is. It comes down to this idea of quotas, which I'm not necessarily a fan of. I think that um, targets are healthy targets are, are, are beneficial because there's a goal in place and it's good to have a goal to achieve anything. But when we have quotas um, and quotas work in the academic space for myriad of reasons, it's totally different industry. But in the in the in the the context of you know an organization a B two C B two B business that might not be the case because it feels punitive. So in this case, this manager actually told their their direct report who happened to be white, I can't hire you because I have to hire the Iranian woman. Uh, and that's a problem too. And, and huge problem that because he was so afraid, right. Of, of, um, of offending this person. He didn't have the language, the tools to navigate the conversation, to explain. And I asked him at the end of the day, was this Iranian woman qualified? Could she do the job? Yes, absolutely. So was it necessary to share that information with Dan, who probably now walked away from the experience also feeling like that's what diversity means. I'm going to lose my position every time to a person of color who probably isn't as qualified as me because that's what happened years ago, which was not the truth, right? Yeah. So we get to start telling the truth and demystifying without having to use coded language like qualified diverse candidates right and yeah to if we we you know when we're mindful of quotas and the potential ramifications they might have on people as well um that also can help to mitigate these ideas of looking for qualified diverse candidates Right. And the implications of the example that you gave is, is it can be so damaging in many ways, one of which is tokenism. You know, what if Absolutely. that, you know, what was communicated and articulated to this other candidate got back to 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 the woman who was eventually offered the position? How does that make her feel? You know, even if she didn't hear about it, tokenism yeah. doesn't always look like I heard and I know it's the yes. experience. 
It's the perception yes. the treatment based on the fact that you're, you are a token, you're one of the only. So now you're trying to prove that you're not the stereotype that people think you are, or you feed into the stereotype. So it doesn't matter right. either way you're set up for failure. Set up for failure, and how exhausting is that? So oh. yes, it's like this vicious cycle. So um, I, I agree with you about quotas. I'm not a big fan of quotas. I am a fan of holding people accountable and That's targets. Right. But where I often find that organizations gain greater traction instead of just gravitating initially to quota and quantitative goals is when they can implement qualitative goals. Yeah. And specifically, what I'm thinking about are process-driven goals. Right? If we could develop this process, make sure okay. that we are now aligning the behaviors of all of the people people so that they're practicing this process consistently, then that should yield the outcomes, right? Dr. White, <laughs> my biggest pet peeve, oh my gosh, is when I am working with an organization, they're like, we have this program and this program and this program. And I'm like, that's great. But what's the strategy? What's the infrastructure? Yeah. Like you're just throwing a bunch of programs. How are you going to yeah. scale the programs? You're donating money to this, you know, philanthropic initiative. Well, how are you leveraging this initiative when there's an event, when there is an, obs an observance? Um, are you inviting this organization to come in, right? Yeah. If you're bringing in interns um, from HBCUs or, you know, HSIs, Hispanic Serving Institutions, what's the conversion? Are you, you know, do we have a way yeah. to convert them? Do we have a open position? positions, entry-level positions, right? So that's what's missing. Like you said, there, there's just a whole lot of programming sometimes. And I'm yes. like, okay, so we I know yep. thoughts here. So yeah. Yeah, that's the difference between activity versus a comprehensive plan that can yield impact. And it, it's so it's it makes a, a significant difference. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but this has been such a great conversation. We're grateful for you sharing with our community today. I um, look forward to um, following your, your future and um, seeing how the book is performing. And I know that many in this audience have noted in the chat that they plan to order the book. And so um, yeah. wishing you all a great and safe um, weekend. And we hope to see you back next week. Friday for another um, episode of Intentional Conversations podcast. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye. -bye. <laughs>